Good evening and welcome to the Tuesday, January 18th, 2022 meeting of the Curriculum Committee. Um, we're going to start this evening with introductions and administrative remarks. Mr. Bechtold? No administrative remarks this evening. Okay, thank you. And do we have any public comment? Okay, I don't see anyone in the room and I'm getting a signal there's nothing uh, by email. So the third item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Has anyone had a chance, has everyone had a chance to review the minutes from last yeah, month's meeting? Yeah. Great. Uh, then we will consider those approved. Uh, item 4.1 is the administration is, ask, is requesting that the below action items be moved to the full board for approval at the January regular business meeting. Mr. Bechtel, did you want to tell us a little bit about these items, please? Certainly. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, we have two clubs for Radnor High School, Cards That Care, and this is a student club that uh, uh, prepares cards for uh, individuals in hospice and uh, nursing homes and sends those uh, to individuals. Um, and then we also have a rock climbing club. Uh, we're very fortunate right across the street from the high school to have a rock climbing center, and so we have some students that are interested in, in organizing and participating in that. In addition to that, we've got an approval of an agreement with our uh, consultant for K-12 counseling audit that's coming up, uh, Mr. William Yarnell. And we're asking the committee move forward this agreement uh, for Mr. Yarnell to serve as our outside consultant for our college and career study. Uh, Mr. Yarnell, just to give a little bit of background, currently works as program director overseeing the college uh, counseling certificate program at Villanova University and he teaches courses focused on college and career readiness at Villanova's graduate school counseling program. He has experience uh, both working uh, as a school counselor at a high school and also in college admissions, working as part of the admissions department at St. Joe's, Westchester, and at Villanova. He has conducted audits of the Snazier for other schools, uh, including Bodder and Prendy and Silesianum and Mr. Yarnell will be working closely with me and Mrs. Ottaviano to lead the committee as we explore how we can improve the college and career experience for our students. So we're looking forward to working uh, with Mr. Yarnell and ask the board to move this forward for full board approval next week on Tuesday. Uh, lastly, we have an overnight student trip, uh, and this is for Model United Nations uh, Philadelphia. We recently had a trip that was canceled. I believe that was Baltimore, Mrs. Kevgis, that was canceled. So Baltimore trip was canceled and the students and the advisors are looking for a replacement trip and so uh, fortunately there's an opportunity for students to participate at the Philadelphia trip coming up. So we're asking that this be more move forward as well. Great, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions about any of these items? Sure. Well, there we go. Um, well, first, I'm really excited to see the college and career counseling audit and the proposal um, to get that whole effort underway. And my question, I actually, upon reviewing this, I, I did reach out to Mr. Bechtel about this question, but I figured I'd share it for the public because one of the questions, and especially in light of um, the last committee meeting, our public comment, commenter was actually about the changing landscape of the college admissions process. And there are a lot of things in the last few years that have really changed, particularly early decision, early action, and test optional. And I, I didn't see it specifically listed. And um, Mr. Bechtel got back to me and said that it would, would appear under the student guidance um, audit. And so I just wanted to make that, a, you know, a, let the public know that we are, in fact, looking at that, because I think it is a critical component to evaluating our you know, make sure that we're up to date on our counseling um, to our students. Anybody else? Okay. So, yeah, this is a really um, important project, and it's one of the district goals. So it is uh, certainly a high-profile item we'll be looking at this, uh, the, over the next few months. Uh, I, un unfortunately for Mr. Bechtold, I grilled him <laughs> for almost an hour uh, about this today, and I, I feel pretty good about um, the decisions he's made. Um, I would ask that we just correct on the agenda his, the spelling of his name. It should be, I think it should be E-L-L. -L. Um, and um, to reassure members of the public who want to keep up to date on this, I think Mr. Bechtold has committed to working um, with the communications department to make sure that we have update, regular updates about the progress of this project on the school district's website. 
That is correct. So we will have a web page that is up. We're working with the communications department, very similar to the sleep study and to the uh, health and PE study that we went through. So uh, members of the public that are interested uh, can follow along on the district website. We will have that up shortly after the committee kicks off in the beginning of February. That's great. Could it maybe be in the Radnor Reader, just so there's a link for people who want to click to that? Absolutely. I just I remember one other thing I did ask Dr. Be Mr. Bechtel about was um, they are going to be looking at best practices, and um, he assured me that we are going to be looking at both public and private schools for the best practices, which I think is important. So. Yes, when we're looking at regionally uh, competitive schools, we're going to be looking both at the private sector and uh, at public schools. So. Great. Thank you. Um, so any objections? Can we move these items along to the full board? OK, great. Um, Item 5.1 on the agenda is a review of the 2022-2023 Radnor Middle School Program of Studies. And the recommended action is that the 2022-2023 Radnor Middle School Program of Studies be moved to the full board for approval at the January 25th, 2022 regular business meeting. I think we have a presentation, Mr. Bechtold? We do. We have uh, Dr. Weidlick and uh, Dr. Bryan from the middle school who will be coming up and they'll be walking us through the uh, additions and changes to the middle school program of studies. So thank you both for joining us. This is very exciting. Welcome Dr. Weidlick and Dr. Bryan. I'm sorry. There we go. <laughs> How's this, good? All right. Well, before we start, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, the time that you've given us to review uh, our program of studies for 2022-2023. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to thank uh, you know, Dr. Batchelor, Mr. Bechtold, and the entire board for supporting the changes and the enhancements that we have made to our middle school programming over the past couple of years. Over the past couple of years, we have added <clears throat> several interest-based electives to our course offerings and expanded our support classes as we continue to fine-tune our MTSS programming and process. You also continually support our mission to do everything we can to support and nurture the development of the whole child, and for that, thank you very much. As we continue to embrace student agency and student voice at Radnor Middle School, we are looking to add one, elective, one um, additional elective next year, and this is to our art program. The title of this course will be Digital Painting with the course number uh, to be determined at a later date. And the description of this uh, new digital painting class is uh, students will learn the basics of digital painting. They will learn how to set up and save their digital files, navigate that digital workspace, and export their files appropriately. Using varied platforms, students will learn the traditional painting process, how to incorporate light, shadows, etc and uh, also um, glean a basic understanding of color theory, how to blend colors, how to add textures. Ultimately, it's, it's something that's new and um, uh, innovative for our students. Uh, we have a fantastic art department, and if anything, this is just going to add another uh, very positive layer to uh, what our kids are already experiencing at the middle school. So uh, this digital painting, uh, will, it, we're looking to pilot it for, an eight, for our eighth grade students for next year. It is a semester-based course. It does not replace or will not take away um, anything from our traditional programming uh, for next year. Can we please scroll? Is there any questions on the digital painting class before, uh, before, we, before we move on? So over the past couple of years, we've added um, electives to specific areas like our FACTS program, which is one of our electives. We wrote, rewrote our curriculum that's more relevant and engaging in our technical education program. We added a humanities-based elective. Um, we added a digital technology-based elective. So little by little, we are adding to uh, the menu that our students can choose from. So um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna skip down to uh, the name change because it'll make sense when I get into the addition of the drop-in center. So uh, one of the, big, the best things about middle school is our advisory period. And at Radnor Middle School, we do not run a canned program uh, because we don't have canned students. We have very unique students, and every year we are constantly uh, looking to change or enhance the, the advisory program. 
So uh, in lieu of in, this year, um, or I'm sorry, next year, in lieu of calling our advisory program advisory, we're looking to call it uh, based on the acronym HMS, Home Base Music and Supports. Um, HMS is a 32 minute period that takes place prior to the beginning of uh, the traditional school day or prior to period one. And it's a multifaceted program that really embraces the, the philosophy and the principles of middle level education. And during this period, uh, students are provided opportunities to attend music ensembles such as band, orchestra, or chorus, uh, or they can receive academic support based on the variety of drop-in centers that we offered, and as well as scheduled intervention classes that kids may have. Um, students who elect to participate in an ensemble class, they're scheduled to meet with their director um, on a, a certain amount of days within the eight-day cycle. Uh, as well as uh, their, uh, their peers um, for their specific rehearsals. The best part of this is, um, is one component of the, of the program where we call it more like a student development um, lesson series. Uh, and this year, one of the things that we're focusing on this in this uh, development series is the 16, or the 16 Habits of Mind. And uh, they are short little mini lessons that, uh, that are delivered to our kids and they, um, Basically what they are is they're, we provide an overview of something like uh, thinking flexibly. And then the kids get into a, uh, to a discussion about that, how they can employ that, what that actually looks like. And all of those discussions are taking place within a, within a very small community. And that community is going to be their HMS, their home base. All right. Uh, but during these sessions, students receive guidance, coaching, strategies that support uh, life-related skills that include, but they're not limited to, relationship building, team building, goal setting, coping skills, uh, responsible decision making, strategic reasoning, and so on and so forth. Um, but ultimately the goal is to provide all of our students mm -hmm. with the skills to work through real life situations that will equip them with strategies to respond to varied things using awareness, thought, and intentional strategy. So, um, it's nothing relatively new. Again, we're just looking to change the name from advisory to HMS, but I think it's, it was important for us to give you an overview of what that program actually looks like, because I think it was kind of like an anomaly. There really wasn't a specific definition or, um, or anything specific to that. And I, was, I would just sure. say, and, and just piggybacking on that, that um, what's great is those extra skills are being taught. The students don't miss out on that, so all students will get. So even if they were, um, involved in an, an MTS or intervention type support during that time, that is not going to occur at the same time as that, so they don't miss out on that. So all students truly will get um, get that that added extra support in there, and so it's like a true two, tier one type support. And we still have those other layers that are also built in, so they don't miss out on that. Okay. Yeah. And then um, lastly, and this is uh, this is not a academic. Uh, I don't say it's not academic, it doesn't have a curriculum per se, uh, but we're looking to add uh, a core support center. So last year we added drop-in centers for the elective areas. We added drop-in centers for world languages, for health and physical education, for art, for family consumer sciences, where students can go down to uh, these specific uh, teachers who, who are instructors in these uh, content areas for extra help, for enrichment, for remediation. Uh, and they were relatively successful, especially uh, when we came back once we reopened from COVID. And they continue to be successful. And those drop-in centers do take place during, uh, during that advisory period as well. And what we're looking to do is now add a, um, some core supports. So again, we're looking to put out as many safety nets for our kids to, to fill in gaps, to catch kids who might be struggling, or for kids who just need some just additional uh, shotgun assistance in specific areas, we wanted to provide them with opportunities that extend outside of the traditional brick and mortar of their classroom. So through these uh, drop-in centers, and we're trying to figure out exactly where they're gonna be, um, a sixth grade student might meet with a sixth grade math teacher on a day that it might be allotted. Mm -hmm. Same thing for the area of science, uh, social studies, uh, as well as English language arts. So if anything, this is just adding to, uh, it's adding to, like I said, the support structures that we have uh, for our kids. So. And I would say it should be noted that the students don't miss out. This doesn't replace them visiting their teachers during, you know, during that HMS period. They can still go see their teachers, their math teacher, whenever they want. This would just be, again, another added layer of support. And actually, to be able to support those teachers, 
um, when they have a lot of kids who may be coming to visit them, uh, they would be able to go to that drop-in center as opposed to maybe seeing their teacher. And again, it's not always just about the actual curriculum. It could be about study skills or how do I, um, how do I take some notes in this class. It could go beyond just the actual core curriculum. I guess, I qu do you mind if I ask a question? Sure, or are you no, yep. keep going? I didn't want to interrupt. Um, th this is a, a neat new concept, and I know we have a lot of drop-in centers. I guess my question, how are you going to advertise this versus other drop-in centers? Are you going to have, will teachers maybe suggest to a student, hey, you seem to be struggling with this, and I'd love to help you, but there's a teacher who's really good at it, and they're at the core, you know, at the drop-in center for core support. You might try, or is it something you might, you know, your parents might hear about through your IEP program, like kind of how will we help students know about this program yeah. and it, so, that it applies for them or that it's helpful to them? I would say through several avenues. Almost everything that you just mentioned would be, would be happening. We would obviously advertise it through the building level, but um, teachers would definitely recommend it. It could be recommended through the MTSS team, through the IEP team. I mean, this is open to all students, so we would definitely make sure that anyone who needed this support we also have a lot of, I'm just going to take math as an example. We have MTSS type level support, pre-teach, reteach right now. A student who might be meeting the criteria and no longer needs that, that two days a cycle to go into that course, a teacher could definitely recommend, you know, as a step down from that, it would be good for you to go to the drop-in center maybe one time a cycle. So this is actually a great, like, true layered system where we can just tease our students out and allow them to have those safety nets still in place to be able to be challenged and still support them at the same time. Hey, uh, the, the, the question I had kind of teed up was just the, the simple um, kind of dicey nature of teenage volunteerism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's good to have a volunteeristic thing like this, but like, I mean, it, it bears no explanation really mm -hmm. in, in in the sense of real, realistically. So, Christine, you, uh, you just answered my question, basically, which was that, um, partially, that there could be recommendations mm -hmm. from teachers. Um, but the nuts and bolts of that are, are interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work, um, the nuances of that? It, it must be tricky, because I, I think sometimes we, you know, there, there's something, something kind of difficult there of, Sometimes the kids who you'd like to see drop mm -hmm. in don't, and vice versa, or not quite vice versa, but you know what I mean. So anyway, it's just a general comment, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to comment further on my comment, that's fine, but i uh, happy to leave it there. You know, when we started the, the after-school tutoring program that we piggyback off what the high school did last year, and uh, we were kind of nervous about that because it's, it's after school, it's on, you know, it's, kids have to want to come. And uh, we didn't think that we were going to get a very high turnout, you know, because again, they're middle, they're 11, 12, 13 years old. I mean, the turnout for our tutoring program has, was much more positive than I thought. It was greater than expected. So our hope is that that trend continues, even once you're in the brick and mortar, once you're in, you know, in the school, like, listen, you know, I don't have band today. I'm going to go drop in to see, you know, whomever. So we'll, you know, we'll see, and we're going to play with that. So if we do see that students are not uh, taking us up on that per se, you know, we will attack different avenues to try to solicit more kids to uh, to attend. I'd also say, like, ideally, like we we're lucky we have a team-based system, right? So we have teachers who all work together and are so close to, you know, each other that they communicate constantly. I mean, we have team meetings on a constant basis. So. Right now, the way things work is that teachers really do communicate with each other um, quite regularly, along with the parents as well, is to keep us of who's really attending, who's visiting um, these centers. I mean, I'm constantly I'm CCing on emails coming from just teachers asking for further clarification or help and assistance for the kids that they're seeing for other teachers. So I think, you know, based off the communication I've seen in our building, I think that'll be a, make it a more positive experience for us for moving forward with it. So just Thank for clarity, for oh, sorry. Um, so this occurs during HMS. Correct. Correct. And and the 32 minutes is that the same amount of time, a time allotment that currently exists for advisory? Yes. So there's no yes. change in the time allotment. Nope. 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 Alani, I'm sure it seems like ages ago. Do you have any <laughs> questions about middle school? <laughs> oh yeah, I did actually. 
Um, so I just kind of want to circle back to, hold on, I'm sorry, the H, I can't see so far. HMS? Yeah, HMS. Mm -hmm. Um, with relationship building, does that entail, um, discussions regarding, like, race, religion, in that field? Because that's important when we're talking about relationship building. So, uh, so, sp well, sp what we're looking to do, what we're doing right now is we are, uh, delving into discussions on, like some examples, like I said, are thinking flexibly, thinking critically, um, being empathetic to to others, embracing difference, uh, celebrating um, everyone within within our building. So they're the type of conversations that we are mm -hmm. uh, navigating um, as we progress in the development of of this HMS program. Topics like the ones that you just mentioned are things that are going to be woven in, where we're going to start to have some classroom conversations surrounding uh, some of those topics, uh, because again. Every student in our in our building, when they come into our building, uh, it is our goal as administrative team, Dr. Brian, Dr. Kent, and myself, is that every student who walks in is feels safe, they feel welcomed, right. and they feel and they know not feel, but they know that this is a place that's going to be accepting of everyone, regardless, uh, you know, of what differences or what uniquenesses that they may uh, have in comparison to their peers. Right. Well, this is also the foundation for high school, and mm -hmm. you know, preparing them for that, and conversations regarding stuff like that too. Yeah. So. That was my question. Thank you. Ms. McMenamin? Okay. Uh, if nobody has any other questions, um, oh, I, I did have actually one question about the drop-in centers. So it's just a drop-in. You don't have to sign up. Do we have kind of a plan to deal with if the drop-in center ends up with lines like sometimes some of the advisory teachers <laughs> have in the morning? Yeah, I think that, sorry, sorry thanks. I think that's something that we're going to monitor. I, I will say right now that I have teachers um, having keeping sign-in sheets, and it seems very archaic, but for our regular math teachers, they're keeping sign-in sheets for to see how many kids are from what um, specific classes are come to visit them. So we'll probably use that as a basis of how many people, how much staff we would need for the drop-in center. Um, we've been collecting that data since prior to winter break. And one of the other reasons for that is this may turn into something where we, we start diving into more enrichment drop-in centers and be able to dive into challenging the kids beyond. So it might not just be for um, recruitment or remediation. It might just be for that deeper dive into the curricular area. So it, there's, it's kind of two-pronged right now. We're, we're collecting that data just to see which direction this may go in. But um, that's where we're at with now. And we're going to use that data to try to help support the staff. I think that's great because I know there are teachers already doing that who already say, come to me in advisory. I see you really like this. I'd love to help you. I'll get you some extra packets. But it would be nice if there's something more centralized that it doesn't have to be a one-on-one -on -one approach to individual students. If there are students who just know it's available, they can, they can ask for it. Exactly. Great. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate, I think, part of this drop-in center seems like a focus on teaching kids to advocate for themselves. Correct. Um, and I, I think you know, sometimes it may be harder for kids to go to their teacher because they're afraid to admit to their, the teacher for, who grades them that they don't understand something. But being able to go to somebody else um, may make them feel more comfortable a little bit. I think through this whole MTSS process, what's really shining for us is that there are students who, like that pre-teach, reteach class, it's two times a cycle. There are kids that are, don't want to come out there even when they meet the criteria, which means they really don't technically need the class anymore. So this is a, I mean, and they voice that, that they really, they feel comfortable and confident and builds that, you know, confidence that, in that area that they're in. So I think this is just going to be another stepping stone to them understanding their own learning abilities and their own capacities and, and that how, how self-advocating for what they do need is, is helping them to grow as learners. So I do really think this is, a, just because of the direction we've been going in, this is really gonna be helpful for those students in particular. That's great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bryan and Dr. Webb. Okay, so uh, I guess we'll, any objections to moving that to the full board for approval? No. Okay. Um, the 5.2 is the Radnor High School Program of Studies for 2022-2023. Um, and the idea is to also move this to the full board <laughs> next week at our full board meeting. Again, we have a presentation, Mr. Bud Mr. We Beckham. do. We have uh, high school principal Mrs. Kevgis here with us, and we've got the assistant principal of academic affairs, Mr. Buderball, and they'll be coming up to go over uh, the new courses, the things that are removed, and the things that have been changed. So thank you both for joining us. 
Wonderful, and you have a tough act to follow, but I know you're up for it. <laughs> Welcome, Mrs. Kavigas, Mr. Boudoir. Thank you, thank you. Everyone knows I like to tease Dr. Weilich, so I'll try to be a little more brief than he was. <laughs> thank you for having us tonight. Um, you know, we do have a very robust change to the program of studies, and you'll see really in two areas where we're looking. Um, one is a result of the PE for Athletes Committee and some new electives that the department is offering and has put in place, um, but also a continuation of our collapsing of academic levels. You know, this past year we collapsed the CP level for the humanities, specifically social studies and English. Next year we're looking to begin that process for math and science. And so Mr. Budabal will be talking a little bit about that and I'll probably jump in here and there. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mr. Budabal. Okay, good evening. It feels nice to be in person. It's been a while, so welcome. Good to see everyone this evening. So as Mrs. Kevich just said, uh, tonight we'll go through the cover page of the program of studies, which appears to be on the screen. I'll just go in order. Uh, and again, the changes, as Mrs. Kevkis just said, many of them are just an outcome or, you know, some of these things happened a year or two ago, and, you know, we're just finally catching up to speed with some of the programmatic changes. So one of the things I'll try to do is just give you some of the background, uh, maybe almost like a runway, if you will, just explaining, like, the context of it for, you know, those, some of us have, you know, children in the high school, others listening in the audience, you know, soon to be, I guess, uh, or some just very interested in their curriculum. So again, I'll try to give more context as we go along. So as we begin the uh, program of studies review and the changes, um, you know, first and foremost is the removal of two courses. You can see both the World Literature CP, again, CP is a college prep level, and uh, just to reference it real quick for anyone that has a program of studies, it's on page 11 of the um, program of studies. So if you're curious to see like what the grand plan looks like, uh, you know, there's a five-year consolidation plan it's referred to. And we're actually living it right now. We're in year one at the high school. So, you know, the freshmen that came in this year, um, you know, they don't have the CP level of English or social studies. So how it works, you know, as they matriculate and move on to the next grade level, the, the CPs just aren't there, essentially. So nothing's taken away from them. It is, they never experienced a humanity CP in the four years they have with us. So again, if you're saying, why is that out of it? You look on page 11, you can see the plan for ninth grade next year. We have the um, English and social studies removed. So again, both those courses um, are going to retire after this, this school year. Um, if you're curious to see what that looks like further in the program of studies, on page 33 and 65 respectively, uh, we create these fancy flow charts, uh, just kind of look at, looking at the sequencing of courses. So on page, both pages 33 and 65, it's the English department, it's the history department, and as you can see in those, you just, the ninth and 10th grader are no longer there. They're removed from the program. Again, so you can see in the very bottom of the screen, the CP college prep, nine and 10, no longer present. Just like you'd see the same thing in um, page 66 with, or part, part, sorry, 65, um, the social studies department is no longer present. So again, that's what it looks like from just a sequencing uh, uh, visual. All right, moving back to uh, other courses. Um, so our second part of the presentation are additions of new courses. And on the first page, there's three. And you know, Mrs. Kevga started the presentation this evening by just kind of giving a little context, saying that you know, back in 2020, there was a health and physical education committee. During the pandemic, health and phys eds experienced many changes. A uh, year before that, the high school underwent a, a sleep study and a late school start time. So between, you know, three years ago with, um, you know, fitness for athletes being present, then last year waiving many of the visit, phys, visit requirements for all upperclassmen, and then 2020, there was a recommendation to remove some of the graduation requirements. So, you know, right now at Radnor High School, you know, if you're a freshman, you have health and PE. It's required. It's half credit PE, half credit health. Sophomore year, everyone has health. However, some students have a quarter credit swimming class. Um, basically, that's, you know, uh, swimming down the one side of the pool, freestyle, two-minute tread, swimming back backstroke. So, again, if you can't pass that uh, freshman year, sophomore year, 10th grade year, you have a quarter credit. So, again, that's what the, the required phys ed classes look like. Last year, when we did this virtually, we retired several health and phys ed classes as part of this, you know, long-term plan, which also kind of connects nicely to the later part of the meeting tonight with the facilities improvement and the ADA wellness um, project of the high school. So again, um, 
the uh, courses we retired last year were intermediate swimming, personal training, and physical fitness, and also fitness for athletes. Uh, also during that uh, committee, uh, they, they surveyed the students to get feedback of what they were looking for, uh, for health and physical education. So some of these courses do connect to that, and I'll try to highlight that as we go through. Um, so the first class, uh, the first PE proposal for next year is called Athletic Performance Training. Uh, as you can see in the description, to try to differentiate the two between what we have currently is a weight training. This one's more geared towards athletes uh, that are currently participating in a PIAA sport at the high school. You know, a couple of years ago, I mentioned we have a fitness for athletes, which is sort of geared towards a similar group of students where these were current athletes and during the school day, they could access their, you know, the weight room or their fitness, really just improving on their development. So again, with, if, you're looking, if you're reading through the description of, I'll call it APT, it just describes that, you know, the high school teachers are working with the coaches, they're developing specific training programs. So, you know, our, our students are really busy. Uh, after school, they have practice, they have games, they have competitions. They have tutoring, the ELP, there are so many things going on. So having that 45 minutes or 41 minutes rather during the school day, a couple days a week to continue that fitness and strength development is a big win for them. And it's also something we heard from the athletes in the survey was that, you know, they want to have more of like a specific course for athletes. Um, you know, so this sort of is, is the response to it. Along the same lines, this is a recommended course. So current students would have a PE class as freshman year or a coach or a teacher would recommend for it. So again, the PE teachers will work closely with the uh, coaches and they'd be in a brand new weight room training facility. So again, some of these are being rolled out as we're hoping to have things opened up in the fall. Our second class, uh, Mindful Fitness. Again, this is a response to some of the information we received in the survey, just about what students are looking forward to in a phys ed class. Um, you know, we hear a lot today with the pandemic about mental health, stress, anxiety. We have midterms coming up at the high school and Mr. Kevigus and I are hearing a lot of feedback from parents about, you know, it's been a couple years since they had a major comprehensive exam. So we know the students are feeling it. So whether you're, you know, a fitness fanatic or a professional athlete, you can take this class and practice yoga, mindfulness, Pilates, among other things. So again, just really finding ways to, to relax, to, to breathe, to just, you know, be, be healthier all around. So again, I know this is more of a long-term, we were talking about so SEL or social emotional learning. So again, this kind of ties in another, you know, long range, long-term goal of our district is looking at SEL, whether it's mental health counselors or just a class during the day where they can have time to, you know, focus on themselves. Again, this class is for anyone in grades 10, 11, and 12. So after they finish that requ required ninth grade class, you know, sophomore, junior, seniors are welcome to take mindful fitness. Our third and final class is called PE Majors. Uh, one of the requests we've heard from our teachers and some students is they wanted some type of honors level phys ed class. Uh, to my knowledge, we've never run an honors level phys ed class. Um, you know, Mrs. Kevigas has been here a few years longer than me, um, but we're not aware we've ever run one. So this is just a response that they're gonna do more creative activities. You know, think about the outdoor enthusiast that wants to just, whether you're, you're going fishing or bowling or hiking or maybe rock climbing at the uh, facility across the street, I think it's called Gravity Vault Rock Gym. Uh, they have trips playing at Linvella uh, Orchards. So again, it's really taking students that are highly motivated, highly interested, looking for outdoor adventures or in, inside adventures, just more of an honors-based class. So again, this is 10, 11, and 12, and it's teacher recommendation. So there are the three new courses uh, that we're proposing for next year. Again. Last year when we sat here, we removed and retired three. These are three new ones. Before I jump into the next one, I just make, I want to make one more point is that some of that survey and feedback from the health and phys ed study was that students want to be able to access the gym or access the facilities during the school year. So, you know, during the last year's pandemic, we had, we'll call it a drop in weight room, which didn't get a whole lot of traffic. Uh, this year we've revised some of the things we're doing. So, you know, throughout the day, at least once a day, some days, twice a day, all the students have access to the gym. So uh, two days a week, we're in something called community period. So our phys ed teachers are wonderful. Uh, you know, one of the teachers runs a uh, uh, ping pong, we'll call it club. So if you pop into the gymnasium, they're playing ping pong during the day twice a week. Also our uh, coach Ryan, or Mr. Mr. Ryan, he uh, is basically running an open gym. So if you pop in community period, you might see, you know, lots of students participating, whether just socializing, some doing hacky sack, they're just being active. Um, that also, to a lesser degree, happens during lunches at this point. So one of the things we had to do with creating more space for eating is uh, we opened up our gym. So our main gym is open every lunch. So it's three 30-minute periods a day. Some kids have more than one 30-minute lunch. They're upperclassmen. They've earned it. They have a free. And so they can play basketball. Some 
pop around the volleyball. So again, students wanted access to the uh, facilities. So during the day, every day, they can play basketball or what have you inside. On nice days, and like recently, they, they'd be in the courtyard as well, getting fresh air and doing other things. So again, that's not a course. It's more of just, you know, kids had the time in their schedule and they're enjoying some of the, uh, you know, activities we have during the school day. Moving on to our uh, second page of new courses. We have uh, two new courses and um, we'll call it, you know, sp special services or student services. The first is called Essential Life Strategies 2. And, you know, for years we have, we've had Essential Life Strategies for students. Um, this is a course typically, you know, it's designed for a student that's been recommended from a teacher or a case manager. It's working on strategies to um, think about positive action, positive response, thoughts, thought, thoughts and actions and feelings. And so this is a class that typically a kid may have if they have an IEP, uh, Individual Education Plan, and working towards coping mechanisms, coping skills, or just social strategies. The challenge is this goal typically takes a year or two or three to achieve, and they need continued support. It also ties in their SEL, social emotional learning, we've talked about earlier in the evening. So again, they even have some of this in the middle school. I'm looking over here at Mrs. McMenamin, and I'm guessing she may be teaching someone that positive uh, action in her curriculum. I see her nodding her head. So this is something that kids have had for years. Um, the, the units, typically, I think, they've been talking to folks, there's four units, and they never got to unit three and four. And so the kids historically would take the same class two or three times. So this really allows our special education teachers to have two separate classes to really develop you know, the next chapter or units and the SEL or the life strategies curriculum. So again, I know our special education folks are really excited to have that you know, course too. So if you're looking through the program of studies for re course revisions, one's called you know, Essential Life Strategies One. The course has always been there, we're just designated as the first course of two. So again, it's just another, another opportunity for students to get uh, support and services throughout the school day. Our second course in the special uh, services department is called Adaptive Health. So again, this course is primarily for students that might be considered like functional support. Uh, so again, every kid has at least two years of health. I mentioned earlier, ninth and 10th grade for we'll say general education. But with Adaptive Health, these are students that may need additional life strategies, if you will, like going to the grocery store, personal hygiene, uh, just talking about just how to function uh, after high school. Uh, are they going to be living independently on their own? So again, it's a very small group of students uh, that you know they just work with um, to to learn how to you know just take care of themselves and function in society. So again, this is called adaptive health. So the curriculum in this is specifically catered towards you know functional support students, not for general ed students, which have those you know grade level we'll call it ninth and tenth grade health classes. Moving on to our last, our sixth, I believe, and final new course is guitar two. So much like Essential Life Strategies one, you know, guitar has been in the high school for a number of years, it tends to be a very popular class. Um, students really enjoy playing and having that um, liberty to just experiment during the day. One of the things that you'll, you'll see in this class is that in the past, the kids want to take a second time. And they're in the class, you have a, a wide range of guitar players. You have students that have never played before to students that can play full songs, they can make up their own music and they're really advanced. So this really is a way to sort of separate and differentiate the two to have more of a level two course where they can have more complex songs, musics, and really develop their passion for guitar. So again, uh, later in the course program of studies, we have a course revision. I just taken what was known as a guitar class to call it guitar one, which becomes a prerequisite for guitar two. So again, there are the six new courses uh, that we're proposing for the 22-23 school year. Mrs. Kegas, did you want to share anything as we um, I'll jump into the revisions you know I'll try to be brief um, so we are looking you know to move towards math and science this year and I think we knew from the get-go that, that would be a little bit more tricky than the humanities just because of the foundation of algebra you know in math and with science there is math always involved in some capacity whether it's graphing skills or you know charts etc um, so when we looked at intro to algebra, which we have in place right now, uh, students that you know come up, come out of course three or Ms. McMenamin's class will usually go into intro to algebra. Um, if you notice, it's now called intro to algebra advanced, right? And we didn't just change it from CP to advanced. We gave a lot of thought, you know, to what the curriculum would look like to make sure that it was challenging our students um, and that it was also meeting their needs. Again, algebra is the foundation for every other math course, so they really have to have a solid foundation. Um, <clears throat> in previous years, they have uh, covered s chapters one through four, and now that will be expanded to chapters one through seven. So the scope of the curriculum you know, is expanding. 
um, as well as the depth. We did also change the prerequisite. Um, again, it's such an important course that we want to make sure that you know students are properly placed. So if a student is coming out of course three with a C minus or less, they're going to be put into intro to algebra. If they have a C or above, they're going to algebra one advanced. Um, and again, we want them to be successful. We want them to feel that they're in the right place and that they're making strides. So we looked at that recommendation or that prerequisite rather. Um, algebra one, right, will cover all chapters one through 12. So a student that's coming out of intro to algebra next year will see the same curriculum again, right, chapters one through seven and then adding on an addi additional five chapters um, in a greater depth, right? So we're trying to set them up to be in a good spot when they go into algebra one. To, you know, to, to ensure that success, um, we have taken our Essentials of Algebra One course and kind of revamped it. So Essentials of Algebra One was something that was always taught by a special education teacher. Um, and we would run a few sections each year. So we have taken that out of the special education department and put that into the math department. Um, we feel very strongly that, you know, it needs to be not only a math teacher, but someone who's teaching Algebra One currently. You know, one of the things that you can always count on with our math department is that they're on the same page, right, almost to the hour, um, which is comforting <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> so, you know, our goal is to have a teach-reteach model where they would be in Algebra One advanced and also be placed in uh, what we have now named Foundations of Algebra to give them that additional support, right? That could be you know, foundations will run as a cycle day class, so they could be in that twice a week if they need, you know, some support. If they need really intensive support, we could put them into that course every single day. Um, it really depends upon, you know, what the needs of the students are. Um, you know, the nice thing is with essentials courses, there's always been a concern, you know, what happens to the student's schedule? Do they lose out? Do they lose electives? You know, do they not get to experience what the other students do? When we changed the graduation requirement with PE, it did open up a window for additional electives. So we did not change the number of graduation credits that we needed. We kept it at 22 and a half because we felt that, that was important to have that number. The amount or the number of electives that students need now has, you know, increased to five and a half, right? So that gives them some additional time to try out some of the other electives that the high school has to offer. Um, going back to the course revisions, Looking at science, right, we took science in the environment, CP, and we changed it to science in the environment advanced. So how is it different? We had put science in the environment back in, Mr. Beck told what, five, six years ago? Right, and the idea behind putting that back in place ahead of biology was for students who were struggling with reading, right? They needed that additional year to increase their reading level because biology is so reading based, right? It really doesn't have too much math in it, but you know, the comprehension skills are incredibly important for them to have. So we wanted to keep that in place to make sure that, again, we were meeting the needs of the students, but at the same time, we wanted to also make sure that they were prepared for that course. So the curriculum will be expanded, right? It will still look at, you know, basic scientific skills. It's gonna focus in on the elements of a lab report on scientific writing, which, you know, is so vastly different than something that they would write in English class. Um, and then towards the end of the course, they're gonna focus in on the first couple of chapters, really the first unit of biology that is so difficult for the kids when they come up, whether in ninth grade or in 10th grade. So they're gonna focus in on the chemistry of life um, and macromolecules, and that will really tie nicely into the whole environmental piece, um, and it will give them a little bit of a head start on that following year, right? So they can start looking at, you know, how do you read a biology text? How do you chunk it? How do you break it out so that it makes sense? Um, so that's how that course will be changing. The rest of the, you know, revisions on the following pages, um, you know, there is some wording that is a little bit different with Earth and space. You know, they're changing the scope to include meteorology um, and astronomy. Full Orchestra wanted to make sure that the requirements were very clear to students as you know, they head into that program, so that's where you'll see a little bit of difference. Um, Mrs. Oksyok has done a phenomenal job of really opening the program up to the community. We had the program at the Willows a couple of months ago, and she's always looking to do open mic nights and, and bring her orchestra you know, out to lunches to enjoy for the kids. Um, she's done a phenomenal job, and so has Mr. Drew. So you'll see that reflected in those two courses. 
And then on the next page, um, you'll see some updates. Intro to Music Technology is adding a different um, program this year. And then Guitar One is revised just to reflect, you know, the difference between that first level and second level course. Um, you know, Mrs. Oksyuk really expanded the curriculum significantly and really wants to be able to meet those needs of the advanced learners. It's become a very, very popular course at the high school. Um, essential life strategies and selective PE, you know, I think Mr. Budabal has already spoken to. And then if you look on that last back page, um, there have been some small revisions to EL, and I don't know if you wanted to speak to that a little bit. Just, uh, as Mr. Kevin said, just some minor changes on that last page with their English language development program. Uh, you know, if you're looking at the level two, you know, formerly it was called beginning, now just referred to as emerging for level two. Uh, the other thing is just classifying or clarifying the number of credits the students have. So, you know, just to give you an example in context, if you will, is that so a new student moves here from another country, they're considered a, you know, level one or entering. And so they have a double period or two periods a day, which is, you know, 82 minutes, 40 minute classes. So again, they get two credits um, and they're with uh, Ms. Mastro for typically it's like first and second period. Uh, so as they progress through, they typically would spend two years in their program. Year two, they'd often be called emerging. It also depends on their language ac acquisition skills. Eventually, typically, you know, middle, like, obviously upperclassmen, juniors, they only have to perform one period a day. So like if you're in the category of um, level three, four, developing, expanding, you know, you have Miss Mastro for your EL programming, one class a day, one period, one credit, and then another class is just a grade level uh, English class usually. So in the very bottom, uh, there's a few notes there just listing that, you know, most likely a student move into an advanced or even a CP or honors level, uh, depending on what year it is in the consolidation program. The other change is some language changes. Uh, so, you know, if you're exiting the program, they're referred to as FEL, F-E-L, former English language learner. So again, just some, some minor changes with the language and classification and clarification of the credits. So again, since I've been at the high school, it's always been a two credit class for the uh, level one students. I, it may have just been a typo left over from years in the past or maybe it changed, but I last. oldest principal was terrible. I wasn't pointing the finger there, Mrs. Kevgis, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, just uh, it's always been just a double credit, so. I think they're all the changes uh, and revisions that that were significant enough to put on the cover page. Um, questions? Do we have any questions? I'm gonna let other people go first. <laughs> I'll start with um, the new courses in athletics. Has there been any thought about the scheduling? Are we? And by that, I mean like when these classes are offered in the day. And I ask this question because I, I, I believe that um, PE for athletes was, wasn't that always tried for eighth period? Because I know we always have that perennial problem of a student athlete who has to leave to go to a comp competition and they're missing their eighth grade, eighth period class. And I know, I believe that's even gotten a little worse with our later start time, you know, earlier start time so that we're later in the day. And, you know, I, I have heard it's happened in my own house and other, like if you get AP physics scheduled in eighth hour, eighth period. So are we trying to offer these so that the student athlete, especially when it's designed for an athlete, that it's offered, that they'd have that option to maybe take some of the load of what they'd be missing in school wouldn't be a core academic class. So one of the things that I drove Mr. Budabal crazy about this summer was um, trying not to schedule any APs or any, you know, singletons, only one section running, even doubletons and tripletons, you know, classes that don't have many sections, eighth period. Um, so he, you know, that was something we were super conscious of and I, I probably did drive you pretty crazy about that, but um, we were really conscious as we build the schedule to make sure that, you know, we're keeping that in mind so that students aren't missing that core instruction. Um, we did take a look with Mr. Friel at the, you know, number of early dismissals per sport and, and trying to be cognizant of the multi-sport athletes as well because, you know, there may be only, you know, two early dismissals for freshman football, but, you know, the student may wrestle and then they might play lacrosse as well. So, you know, we always are keeping that in mind. Um, I think when we did change the start time, it was a little bit of a challenge, but with more schools, you know, starting to move in that direction, I think we're going to be in a much better spot. Just, uh, you know, continuing that thought was that, you know, the difference too, I think, for this year is that, 
you know, before juniors and seniors had to take physical education, you know, they had to have four years of it. And that was kind of like the premise behind fitness for athletes is that if you have to take phys ed, do it during eighth period so you could, you know, exit for your game, what have you. So, you know, now just it's no longer a requirement. So you don't have that gym as many at the end of the day quite as much. But again, as Mrs. Kevka said, we're very deliberate with which classes are running into the day. You know, if an AP runs, which I don't know if it did, we typically have seven or eight sections where, you know, it's not the only one, the only time. So, you know, about half of our school students do participate in a sport. So if we're talking about a large segment, you know, of our, our student body. Right, right. I think you're asking a couple of questions. Yeah. You know, I, th I think one of them, and if I'm mistaken, tell me, um, Mrs. Duffy, I think one question is, you know, if the student is going into Algebra one as a ninth grader, do they have an option to accelerate and kind of get to grade level, right? Because most freshmen are taking geometry. Is that part of what you're asking? Yeah, well, I, I understand that they'd have to take a summer course, okay. right? If they want to get back to where they're taking calculus, that was, you know, I think I understand that, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about that in the township, right, about that change that we made. But I'm just, you know, the student that is ready for the next step, for more acceleration, for mm -hmm. a more rigorous class, who did very well in course three in eighth grade, no, does not have an option to take honors algebra. That's, that's true. One of the things that, you know, our math teachers do really well is they differentiate, right? So if you have a student who's in that course, and you know the teacher sees that they're really excelling, they're going to give them, you know, enrichment. They're going to work with them to, you know, give them additional practice, challenge them in different ways, and potentially at the end of that year, right? It, there's always a gap, right? There's always a, a challenge moving up a math level, um, but if that's something that they feel that they could potentially explore, they will help them pursue that. So that so the next step, the first opportunity they'd have is to go into honors algebra, uh, honors geometry. Geom correct. Right. Okay. Correct. Um, and and then just um, I did have a question, one other question, because I looked through the the program of studies, and just right now in eleventh grade viewpoints is the integrated class, mm -hmm. but you know in this course it says that it's eleventh graders, but next year it will be also offered to twelfth graders. It's going to be a mix. Yeah. Yep. So it's just it just so you know it's not listed like that in this book. So. We're not changing it pro programmatically. Because you're me. not opening because it up Because we're not everyone. opening it up. Now, okay. if we saw that what we had last year, you know, became a consistent issue, then it might be something that we want to look towards, you okay. know, expanding it to both grades. But I don't think we, we really have that one data point from last year, so I don't, I, I don't want to make that judgment just yet. I want to see what happens, okay. you know, in the next couple of years, and then I think we would reassess at that point. But that course will still be Absolutely offered for open. the... Promise. The students, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> promise, promise. You Thank have me you. on record. It's being taped. <laughs> you know, Mrs. Duffy and I will both be here yeah. in the fall. Oh, I know. You know where I live. <laughs> was, was that everything? Okay. Dr. Babson, did you have some questions? Okay. Uh, I had a couple, if nobody else does. 
Um, so the, I, I wanna say thank you. I, I know we removed a bunch of PE classes last year and I really appreciate, I know there was some concern last year that we weren't replacing them. I really appreciate that the PE department took the time to be responsive to the, to the needs of the students and the wishes. Um, and I really appreciate, I think the mindful fitness looks like it's not just for athletes. And I appreciate that they are, it's not a, they're not revamping the PE department just for kids who believe themselves to be really athletic, but also for kids who uh, want to just try some of those things. Um, I had a question and I, I apologize, I could have asked you this before, I didn't notice it. So the, um, the majors, the PE majors is a, is a weighted honors class. And I guess I just want to understand you know, what makes that an honors PE class other than it's just kids who are extremely competitive? Are there obligations outside of the school day? I mean, some of these things seem like, you know, golfing and fishing clearly aren't on site. And I know we have block periods, but it's, it's not that long a time. So I'm just wondering kind of, are there outside of school obligations for this program? And I guess that's two questions, but. So to, to your point before about, you know, revamping the program, I think, one of the things that they tried to keep in mind as they were looking at things was really meeting the needs of, of all the students, right, athletes and non-athletes. Um, what you see in PE majors, again, is it's for athletes and for non-athletes, right? But it has a really strong focus um, on lifelong activities. So I think that the rigor of that, you know, whether it's hiking or whether it's climbing or golf, those are, those are skills that you have to build, really be committed to doing to do well. Um, and so I think that was the intent behind that. It's not just to show up for class. You've actually got to participate and build some, <laughs> build some skills. It's not a PE yep. class from our era. <laughs> <laughs> not that any of us just showed up for class. <laughs> I, I'm just going to confess I still don't play pickleball very well. Um, I'm going to buy you a pickleball set. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my, another question, and I, you, you mentioned that there's been access to the athletic facilities, and I really appreciate that, especially with some of the outdoor facilities being closed. Yep. Um, and I, I know you probably can't necessarily schedule all of this yet because it's not open, but we're gonna have a new fitness center at some point in the fall. Even though it's not in the curriculum, will the, will the high school be committing to kind of opening that for some kind of free access to students at different parts of the day? We would certainly want to look at that. Um, what it would look like is likely a teacher duty, right? We want to be able to right, have access to those new facilities for sure. Well, yeah, what we've done in the past is that the health and phys ed department typically would cover that as one of their duties. Um, you know, this year we have some logistical challenges with just serving lunch in three, or eating in three areas and so forth. That once the fitness area is open, we'd love to put our health and phys ed teachers in there a couple periods, if not all periods a day, just uh, providing support. And we have a lot of other, you know, teachers what might be in there as well that you might be coaching a sport what have you so again that's a fairly popular duty to have but I think we could certainly do that <laughs> no that, that's great um, I really appreciate um, the mindful approach to the um, the special education courses and the fact that we're not just asking kids to repeat a class that they've already had that if they've advanced we're going to actually give them credit and a course to move them to the next level so thank you very much for that um, the, the other question, and I had this for the middle school, but I didn't harass them because I, I, didn't, I wanted to make sure we had enough time for you. <laughs> oh, I may ask it afterwards if we get a chance. Could you just share with the community, look, moving into high school is really stressful for a lot of middle school students. It's stressful for their parents. Um, and I, I happen to know personally what you're doing recently, but I think it would be really helpful if you explained it, especially for parents of seventh graders who are you know, anxious about what's gonna happen next year, if you kind of explain how you prepare eighth graders and actually separately new students to the high school, people who didn't come through our middle school program, how do you prepare them for the program of studies and setting up their, um, their plan of studies for their four years at the high school? You want to talk a little bit about your visit and then I'll talk about the other piece? Certainly, I'll start. Um, you know, believe it or not, it's starting right now. Um, so it usually kicks off uh, last week and just to talk to the community, if you will, is that, uh, you know, we met with all the eighth graders, which is amazing. Uh, just seeing them in person with everything happening with the pandemic, it, it was hard to get everyone into an auditorium. They were spaced, every, two seats between every student. It was great to see them. It's a rather, relatively smaller class. But again, uh, we went down to speak to them. We had several student uh, students with us, which was a great leadership opportunity. And so it was much like tonight, just 
talking about the new courses, talking about program options, talking about what a typical freshman year would look like. Uh, and the great thing was we had students with us at the high school, so they were just sharing their experiences, that what they learned. And I think that was one of the first steps and the important steps. Kids were talking about their classes, and it's interesting what kind of questions eighth graders ask. You know, we went through this 45-minute presentation, and in the presentation, the girl raised her hand, and she said, what's a credit? And we're like, <laughs> yeah. And so the kids were explaining, you know, the differences and so forth. But again, the great thing was is that the kids are worried about the challenge and rigor of high school. Um, and, and so one of the most popular questions we get was, you know, going from a grade level or an accelerated eighth grade class to an honors or advanced or maybe even like a seminar type class. And it was just nice hearing the students talk about their experiences where some had accelerated classes and they were very well prepared for an honors. Conversely, you know, one of the students was talking that she never had uh, an honors or accelerated class in middle school. Now she has a handful of APs. She's going to American University. Just, you know, it, she challenged herself. And same thing with another guy that's on the baseball team, just like, just an average kind of kid, taking average classes all of a sudden, finds a spark, finds an interest, has a couple APs, and just finds his passion. And it, I think that was nice hearing their stories because it's easy for, not easy, but we can tell them to take this class or it's easy, you can be successful, or maybe it's hard, but having the students share their experience is really powerful. So to your point, started last week, we also have what's called Winterfest and Parent Presentation Night. So on Thursday night at six o'clock, we did something kind of similar, live Zoom webinar with all the eighth grade parents. We had close to 150 parents online uh, that night. And then at seven o'clock, we had probably around 30 or so different department chairs, clubs, sports teams, drop in Zooms, just talking about what we offer, whether you're, you know, it's an art program or a math program. So again, that's really the start of the process. Um, so again, that's the eight to nine transition. Uh, over the summer, we do a number of different program um, opportunities. Uh, they have different devices when they get to the high school. So we have a day where they come in and they log in, they just go through this, the process of, you know, imaging their device, if you will. Uh, we have leadership opportunities for our students. They do tours of the building. Uh, just really just acclimating them in that tr transition process. Um, we have special events for our new families. Uh, we have a new family day where I think they come in and we did like a pizza party in the past. Um, just walking through the building, getting to know their teachers, walking through the schedule. I think this middle school used to call it, you know, walk in your shoes. So kind of like the same premise is that they get their schedule, uh, say, we do it August 15th, the schedules are released. So they come to school, they get a physical hard piece of paper with their schedule on, they walk through the building, walk through their schedule, they get to meet with their upperclassmen to talk about the school. They can see every part of the building, it's a large building, the cafeteria, how to get your food, how the lockers work, just really, so there's things that kids are worrying and fearing and not knowing, trying to ease them as much as possible. Uh, so that's some of the things we do from the eight to nine transition. Uh, PT? I'll just piggyback off of that. Um, they also come up in the spring to take a tour of the school. So a lot of the, you know, conversations that we have in August um, get reinforced, you know, early in the spring and then they hear it again, you know, different strategies for studying, um, stress, anxiety along those lines, you know. And mis like, to Mr. Budabal's point about hearing from other students, I mean, we can talk to the, we're blue in the face and it's, you know how you are with your kids, right? They don't hear a thing that you say. So it's really good to have that student perspective and Dr. Batchelor, thank you for all your support. You know, we had talked a couple years ago, um, Mr. Beck told as well, about putting a, a mentor program in place for our freshmen. And that was really, you know, the piece that was missing. We had that freshman fundamental day, but it was a day, right? And it wasn't a continual piece. Um, and so that started, believe it or not, over COVID, over Zoom. Um, you know, we have continued to expand that where they have monthly meetings. Mrs. Raines is now leading that program and doing a phenomenal job you know, where they meet with students each month and there's a different topic. So this month, for example, they'll talk about midterms, how best to prepare for them, what is it like? Um, and they all may be going through that together <laughs> considering the, you know, the fact that we haven't had them in a couple of years, but most of the, you know, topics, course selection, um, all of those things are really good for them to connect with the upperclassmen, especially if there isn't a sibling or an older sibling and they really don't know the way the high school works. So they feel like they have that support um, and they're hearing it, you know, from people that have already been through it in addition to their teachers. So. I think, I think the final point that just to, you made is that, you know, we do have that one big orientation day. However, we know that during the summer, our families are busy. You know, they're at the shore, they're traveling, and, what, and some students are new to the district. And so I know last summer, uh, Dr. McNamara, is back there. We did, I, I lost track of how many tours we did. You know, families are like, we really wanted to come in and see the building. We're away. So, you know, we want you to be at Radnor High School. We want to make it as comfortable as possible. Uh, we have a special education transition meeting coming up here in about a week or so. 
uh, for eighth grade parents that have some a child with an IEP. So again, either Mrs. Kevgis or I, or both of us some years go down and talk to them. We just, high school teachers come down. So we really try to find as many opportunities as possible just to make that transition smooth. And if you miss one of the formal opportunities, we're always here to meet or talk and take on a you know, tour of the building in the summer if you're a new family or just you missed out on the official orientation day. That's great, thank you. Now, and and I, I know there are a lot of efforts around that. I have an eighth grader, but I, I wanted to make sure I <laughs> people. So does Mrs. Duffy. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate that. Um, nobody else had any other questions about the program of studies? Okay, great. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Bechtold, would you my apologies. May I go backwards on the agenda? Would you mind if I ask the same question of the middle school leadership since they're still here? Do you Certainly. mind, Dr. Widelick and Dr. Bryant? <laughs> I was so focused on making sure we got out of here on time. I didn't want to, um, you know, ask more questions than were necessary. But I think it's a good time while we're talking about this to, for you to share with fourth grade parent or fifth grade parents or people who may be entering the district. <laughs> Uh, to understand how we try to get our, our rising elementary school students and, and students who are new to the district, how we get them ready for the middle school. So do you mind taking some time to explain that? Sure. So, um, so let me start with uh, one of the things that we, that we do is we'll put together, at least during COVID, what we did is we put together video presentations mm -hmm. of our entire uh, our course offerings that we have, both core and encore. And we highlight a little bit about what each of the elective areas are, what the core areas are, what they look like. And the reason why we decided to do video, well, aside from the obvious, but this is something that parents and students can rewatch as many times as they, as they would like. Um, also, uh, one of the things that our school counseling team did a couple of years ago, and we continue to reuse those videos, is we do like almost like a, di uh, like a digital tour uh, of what our building looks like and, and, things, and things like that. Um, as a administrative and a school counseling team, we go down and we meet with the school counselors and administrators of each of the three elementary schools, just so we can highlight to them to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of course offerings, in terms of what we can provide students as they come into the middle school. Um, because they often will get the questions that we may not get because those families feel more comfortable and they have you know, already built and sustained relationships with a lot of those educators at the elementary level. But um, Dr. Bright, do you want to talk uh, something? Move up day also. Uh, the, so the other thing is um, we have done you know, move up days. Um, we've, the students are coming, well, so the past couple of years they have not, but that's what the, that's what the tour was. But uh, we've had move up days where uh, the students will come in, they'll do tours of the building. We've allowed open, like open door access throughout the entire summer for families to come in if they'd like to, for kids to come in. Um, and then the other thing that we're very proud of is our web program, uh, where everyone belongs, where uh, Mr. Deal and our school counseling team and our entire administrative team really jump you know, together on the same boat to make sure that all of our kids um, have some sort of trusted peer or a peer that's already in the school um, that kind of help them navigate that middle level process. So we're trying socially, emotionally to make sure that, our, that the kids that are coming up, that their needs are met academically, that their needs are met. Um, and that just, you know, we're all on the same page when the kids uh, do come in, so. So one thing I think uh, actually a positive that came out of COVID was um, given that we couldn't have the kids come up for a move-in day, we, uh, myself and uh, uh, the six, would be sixth grade counselor, we went down to the elementary schools and we visited them during lunches, which was fantastic because we, is actually with a smaller venue, you really got to meet the kids. You, it was actually a lot easier to remember them when they asked questions, so when they moved up, it was like, I, they were like, I remember you, I remember you answered my question about Chick-fil-A. <laughs> um, so I mean, that, that actually put more of a, I think a close knit tight, you know, tie to us. And when they came in, they already felt really comfortable, which I thought was a big, um, a big win. And we would actually move, even with COVID and move up day, I think I would still say we continue with that um, just because it really personalized us to the kids. Uh, the other thing is, um, one thing that we were really, I think our sixth grade teachers do anyway, but we were truly trying to highlight this year was really diving into watching those, the executive functioning skills, like the goal setting, um, test taking strategies. Like we, we did a lot of uh, PD at the beginning, and we're going to actually have um, dive more into that in February. Where we're trying to really drive into the staff where they can incorporate those skills into the gen ed setting. You know, and um, being in sixth grade this year, we were really 
you know, when we meet monthly, we, we talk about those skills and how we can even highlight more, maybe things we have to change or tweak based off, especially with COVID and, and the ramifications of that. If there's things that we need to change or update or, you know, to, to those conversations we have with students. That's been fantastic because we've probably dove a little bit deeper into like locker clean outs and, and how you organize your materials and note taking strategies and time management, which is all things that are truly middle school appropriate. Um, and we also dove into things that just those, soft, those student skills and we have, um, I think the habits of the mind, all that, that really kind of encompasses everything, even though I know it's for the entire building. I think as we see that grow, we'll see that it starts to tear out a little bit more as to what sixth graders are experiencing the seventh grade and the eighth grade. And the one thing I do kind of want to see a common thread start is that goal setting. So in sixth grade, what are your goals when you move forward? What's the goals then for seventh and in eighth grade? And that really, I think, will help um, with the transition into the high school. So they'll really get to know themselves as learners and as thinkers and as what, what are their strengths and their weaknesses so they can really kind of dive into that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we forgot. We do for um, our identified population, we do have transition meetings. So we do have those meetings with some parents. So we do have, it just depends on the child and, and then what the needs are, but we have had individual meetings at the end of the year. Um, so we get to really understand what those needs are for those specific children um, that are identified. And again, we have a ton of uh, constantly all throughout the summer, we have students who come in and do tours of the building. And sometimes even students who have more specific needs, they'll come in and we'll do individual tours and make sure that they walk through their schedules that we designated a week in August once the schedules go out where they can reach out to their counselor, the sixth grade counselor, and they would be able to come in and do a tour with either the counselor or the, the administrator that's uh, gonna have that receiving grade level. And then the last thing that we're gonna do this year is we're gonna do, uh, either it's gonna be Zoom drop-ins uh, where parents can come and ask questions, whether we do it by elementary school or do it as just one huge collective. We're not sure yet. They're at the beginning phases and we'll let Mr. Dukevich and you know, all the three elementary principals know uh, what our plans are, so. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so that was uh, agenda item five. Uh, is there any new business this evening? Okay, uh, public comment. Have we had any public comment come in? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Dukevich, you did have new business. No, this is my job tonight. So we have one public comment uh, from Suzanne Fleming, 221 Pine Tree Road, Radnor. I recognize the strength of the Radnor Math Program and the work of the teachers and administration to make it successful. With that being said, I do believe there needs to be more attention paid to the movement of students, especially in the middle school setting. Having a son who met requirements of A's on all unit tests in course two math last year, but was unable to move up to honors in eighth grade due to the results of a mastery test, he had to take on information he was never taught, does not seem right. Our son initiated a huge interest and drive to move up to eighth grade honors and therefore was emailed an enormous packet of information the day before spring break 2021 for him to master and be tested on in early June. Unfortunately, he did not do well on the test. Uh, at this, this was the time he was getting back in the classroom and life for our students was anything but normal. The students who moved levels the year before had to take a mastery test and never had to take this one. Although I was told one class did take it just to see how they could do and they did horribly. In my experience and in talking to others, it is apparent that the requirements we put on a student to move up versus what is required of a student to stay in the class are very different. Nowhere is this clearer than in the time of COVID. The fact that our son initiated clear interest, which doesn't happen very often in moving math levels and proved that he could do well should have been enough for him to be given the chance. Having shown his ability to master a year's worth of work and knowing our child, we also believed he deserved it and could handle being moved up. The hardest part for us as parents was that we tell our students, our kids to strive and push themselves, but when he proved himself, he wasn't given the chance. The worst case scenario of him moving back down to grade level math never would have been, never would have this been a better time than in middle school where the stakes are not too high. On the high school Zoom call last week, the head of the math department said in regards to moving up in math levels, quote, the earlier the better, end quote. Why would middle school not be the place to do that, to do, to do that especially when a student scores A's on his or her math test? At the very least, all students should be held to the same standards. Currently, our son has a 96% average on math course three. Next year in ninth grade, he has no options to go to honors. He only has one algebra one course option. How do we challenge that him? He is growing and maturing, 
but has been squashed of any other chances, chances to move up. In the current trajectory, his only option would be to take a summer course, which I'm hoping will have a remote option. I think that this really needs to be addressed as in the current state, this only encourages more and more parents to try and attain outside help as an early age to help make sure this child gets the, on the right trajectory. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Dukavich. Uh, uh, Ms. Dunn, yeah. can I just jump in for a yeah, second? Please. So, uh, just to respond to that uh, public comment that was just said, uh, we did receive feedback last year from some parents about uh, the opportunities for students to accelerate in the middle school. As you know, um, a couple years ago, we instituted at what is very popular now a, a high school summer school course specifically for math. And uh, we've had students that have taken advantage of that. Uh, internally as administration we have been having conversations about replicating um, that at the middle school and so we're looking at different options currently as administrative team both with the middle school administration and central office administration to find um, ways that we can have our students accelerate um, where they could be successful so that is one of the things that we are currently looking at right now and the, the context of it is uh, if we could replicate the high school summer school program at the middle school. So that's, we're in open discussions about that and we hope to provide additional information at a future curriculum committee meeting. Okay, thank you. I mean, I think Mrs. Duffy asked a question along these lines about why we don't have honors. It, it might be something you could consider down the road, whether it makes sense to, to have an honors algebra one class in, you know, when we no longer have a college placement. So rather than just having the uh, accelerated course, if we also had a, an honors course and you know and that would be for students who come from outside the district and maybe have a better foundation but still aren't where but we'll leave that to you guys yeah I think we need to look at that and, and I want to thank the public commenter because that's one of the things that I know as Mr. Bechtel mentioned we've been looking at is that seventh eighth grade transition if, if maybe we had something even in that summer um, to have helped a student in that situation because to have moved them um, from seventh to eighth grade um, and whatever that type of a summer program could have been um, would be the right time, I think, from, from hearing that situation and being aware of other situations. So I know that's something we're looking at. As to the other question about, you know, that the board's bringing up, I think is a good question about, you know, do we have an algebra, algebra course that is a honors level course, you know, at the high school? Um, I think one of the things we need to look at and go back is, and I'd want to understand just in the future, not for tonight, is how, you know, when we look at our, our, our chart, and I was listing some questions here, you know, how many times does the arrow go up? You know, how many times does, you know, uh, an algebra, how many times will an algebra 1A student move to honors geometry? You know, we, we, we want to make sure we have, as much as we have off ramps, we want to make sure we have as many on ramps as well. And I think that's something for us to continue to look at and monitor, and, and I know it's something that we have as a district continued to tweak, and, you know, it's thanks to parent feed like, feedback like that that does help us. Well, and I think one of the things we talked about last year when we looked at this issue was sometimes there are kids who feel like the honors class is going to be just too much, and so they take the accelerated course when they really are perfectly capable of the honors class. They just didn't want the stress and strain, and I'm not saying they should endure that, but maybe as we're um, eliminating the college placement course, some kids will feel the need to be more challenged, and so there may be just kind of a natural need for an honors course in that level. Yeah, and I think, you know, the challenge in, in, in math more so than any other department, and, uh, you know, highlights this, is that, you know, we don't want to have students, you know, we don't want to see a student move up in a, a, a course in an area and then struggle. We know that Algebra 1 is, is really a gatekeeper of a course. The success in Algebra 1 does dictate your success as you move on beyond, uh, you know, through your high school career in math. But at the same time, sometimes our fears of kids struggling and not making also sometimes I feel, and I'll just say as a parent in another district, sometimes it makes it feel like it's harder for kids too to when all of a sudden that light bulb goes off, what are those chances and those opportunities to have on-ramps? And I think we need to continue to, to look at that and make sure that they're reasonable on-ramps that they, they have to move. Yeah, and what I could really appreciate on that, on the public commenter was that, you know, that. I, I like the idea of having that program in seventh to eighth grade because as a parent I can appreciate like you if if your child is showing initiative and wants to take a move and wants to be challenged it is the right place in middle school at least to attempt that often because 
you know, you do worry about making that move in high school. And I know, like, even I was, I attended um, the, the parent session on Thursday. And, you know, if they were talking about, like, if a teacher, you know, was about teacher recommendations for honors, right? So if a teacher recommends you and you go, right, and you go and, and you, you, your student then gets stressed, you can move down, right? But if, if the parent push, you know, if the, if the student is pushing and then the parent says, okay, go for it, you know, let's do it, let's try it, and they override a teacher, then it's a W. So all of a sudden the stakes feel a lot higher in the high school. So I can appreciate what the public commenter was saying is that if, why can't we try in the middle school to see if we can, you know, get success and build momentum there. Yeah, and I hope, I hope, I think as Mr. Beckel said, we'll have more information to share about some potentials for how we could help to do that, you know, at the middle school uh, in the future with, w w and again, whether it's a, you know, one of the things I like the idea, and look, thinking of that particular situation, if there had been something in the summer, um, you know, for that student, even if there was something that was remote for a couple of weeks or an asynchronous program, because the, the light bulb went off for that student. That student now is all of a sudden wants to, they're asking to move up, okay. You didn't meet our criteria, but here's how you could, here's another avenue, but it, it requires the student, obviously, to put in some work. Um, so we're looking at that. We'll see what, what, what comes of it. That's great, thank you. Um, so I think we're pretty much done. I just wanted to remind everyone that the next meeting of the Curriculum Committee is currently scheduled for uh, Tuesday, February 15th uh, at five o'clock here in the basement of the administrative building. Thank you very much. I just, yeah, oh, that's good, we're ended. No, just thank, they're, they're still here, thank you all. Thank Turn you all very, very much. Thank you all, both the middle school and high school administration, thank you.